morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, we have a fascinating session uh, slated right now uh, about diabetes and cancer, gene therapy and environment. There's been a huge talk on uh, diabetes predisposing to cancers and then a huge uh, debate over the last one decade. Some of the therapeutic interventions actually aggravating the tendency to develop diabetes. Even though a lot of data has come in and most of us seem to be reasonably comfortable by now, uh, but a lot is happening in that uh, area these days. Uh, we have a colleague who is going to talk about it as a professor of hematology at uh, Wisconsin. He's the director of adult blood and marrow transplant program at uh, Fratford Hospital and section head hematological malignancies and transplantation in the Division of Hematology and Oncology in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Well-known researcher, has more than 100 peer-reviewed publications. I would request him to start his talk. Dr. Harry. Thank you, Dr. Zagar. Uh, thank you to everyone who is here for, for listening to this talk. And uh, thanks to my friend, uh, Dr. Jodhadev and the Jodhadev Professional Educational Trust for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about cancer and diabetes. It's a, you're all diabetic specialists or people with an interest in diabetes. I have no knowledge of diabetes except very basic. Uh, but I have knowledge, my area is cancer, so we'll try to see how we can merge the two. Uh, and the, uh, some of the points that uh, our chairman uh, just so nicely summarized. So uh, this is the overview of the talk. This is how we'll approach the problem, you know, the scope of the problem in, a, in the epidemiologic sense. Uh, how big is the problem? Uh, there are, both are chronic diseases and how many people are living with this. And the mechanisms and biology of this problem is fascinating. Uh, in the last three to four years, we have understood a lot more things how human beings who live for longer and longer periods of time um, are now facing these combined problems of obesity, metabolic syndrome, cancer, aging. And these are all at the cellular level linked to certain evolutionary adaptations that served us in the past but are becoming a problem for us in the future. And then finally I'll summarize with some areas of research. So as you all know, the, the most uh, top two killers in the Western world or in the developed countries, in, in that situation, we are also rapidly reaching there, uh, are heart disease and cancer. Heart disease is still number one, and cancer is set to overtake heart disease within the next few years. And in all developed societies, this is the case, because infections and other problems have gone away. Uh, and if you took the top 10 mortality things, you can see that diabetes comes to number seven. But it's probably an underlying contributor to no number one and number two, too. So we have a huge issue here. It is a, not only a disease that kills, but it, it's a contributor to death in the top two killers. Just these four chronic diseases, cardiovascular, chronic respiratory disease, type two diabetes, and cancer, cause 52% of the deaths in the Western world. And I'm sure this is going to be the case in Kerala or other societies which have actually gone past the stage of infections and infectious diseases killing people. So, but it's not just diabetes. Beyond diabetes, there is the whole issue of impaired energy metabolism and cancer. Cancer, as we understand it, is a, at, at its basis, is a cellular dysregulation or failure of cells to regulate themselves. And we now have evidence that Energy metabolism is very closely linked to how cells kill themselves, how cells um, um, go through aging, and how cells prevent cancer growth. There are about 70 million people in the United States living with metabolic syndrome, and about 100 million people living with cancer. There's a lot of overlap in the people with metabolic syndrome and cancer. And some of the consequences of metabolic syndrome is type 2 diabetes, but beyond that, there is cardiovascular health, and beyond, beyond that, there is cancer. Almost 20% of patients with cancer have diabetes, and there is reason to believe that having diabetes predisposes one to cancer, just as our chairman just mentioned. If you look at the association with cancers, you can see that um, in that plot here, uh, there is a 82% li higher likelihood of pancreatic cancer in patients with diabetes. There's a 30% likelihood of higher likelihood of colorectal cancer. Liver cancer is almost a 250% increase. 
Breast cancer is a 20% increase. Endometrial cancer is about another 200% increase. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma, kidney, all of these cancers are increased in patients who have diabetes. There's only one cancer that's actually decreased in people with diabetes, and that's prostate cancer. And we think the mechanism for that is hypoandrogenism, or reduced uh, testosterone in men with um, pre-existing diabetes, which then le leads to lowering of risk of prostate cancer. If you look at this syndrome, there is type 2 diabetes at one end. There is the metabolic uh, consequences that lead to this in the middle, obesity, lack of physical activity, hyperinsulinemia, inflammation, poor diet, and then scans are on this end. And this overlap is almost 70 million people in the United States. Contrary to what most people believe, hematologic cancers, I'm a specialist in hematologic cancers, and hematologic cancers are also increased in people with diabetes. And most of the hematologic cancers, like lymphoma and multiple myeloma, are actually diseases of inflammation. They are cancers that arise in the setting of inflammation. And as you can see, both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, multiple myeloma are increased, and leukemia and lymphoma are also increased by about 40 to 50 percent. So there is a huge, you know, an increase in risk of 40 percent in leukemia is a fairly dramatic increase. But it's not just diabetes. It is the pre-diabetic stage which also predisposes to cancer. This is the effect of obesity and gender in the risk of cancer. You can look, think that, so there's people who are healthy or overweight, then there's people who are obese, very obese, and morbidly obese. As you can see, the darkening shades indicate higher levels of obesity. So you can see that if you're a woman who's morbidly obese, all cancer risk goes up by about 60%. If you're a man, it's only 52%. Here again, men have it better than women. In kidneys, morbidly obese women, about 375% increase. Liver cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, everything. So there's a dose effect of obesity. The more obese you are, the more risk you have compared to people who have normal weight. So there's, it's almost a dose effect. And this is, you know, we all know about the uh, epidemiological associations of Cox postulates, things like that, where if you have to show cause and effect, one of the things is if there's a dose effect. Here there's a dose effect of obesity on the risk for cancer, suggesting that there is a causal effect. In the end, you know, what you, of all of us sitting here, almost 25 to 30 percent of us are going to get a cancer. And the most, the good news in that is that most of us are actually going to be cured of that cancer. But the bad news is that once you get cured of cancer, you're going to have actually to live with the consequences of that. One of the consequences of cancer treatment is the induction of diabetes because we use a lot of steroids. A lot of people who get, go through treatment and get cured end up having steroid-induced diabetes that then continues over life. And then they have two chronic diseases. So the question is, if you have diabetes and then you get cancer, are you going to do just as well if you did not have diabetes? So is cancer worse in people who have diabetes? This is a plot of multiple studies that have examined that question. As you can see, in almost all the studies, people with diabetes have a poorer long-term survival if they have cancer compared to people who did not have diabetes at the, type of can at the time of cancer. So having diabetes makes your cancer outcome worse. That's also another reason not to get diabetes. And that's again not just diabetes. If you're obese, just obese, not, not actual diabetes, at that time it's a, you're, you're actually having your metabolic pathways set in the direction of poor outcomes. People with obesity who have a cancer have a worse outcome than people who are non-obese. That almost is, seems intuitive, but that is true. So then we come to the question, why does this happen? So when I was a medical student and when I, you know, even 10 years ago, I used to tell people, if you're obese, if you have, you have altered fat metabolism, you have insulin resistance, you have higher levels of insulin floating around, you have insulin-like growth factors in your blood, fatty acids metabolism, free fatty acids in circulation, uh, estrogen metabolism gets changed, so you have higher levels of hormones, all of these cause cancer. It is actually beyond that. The simplistic view is still the same, higher levels of IGF. IGF is a very powerful cancer-stimulating hormone. IGF receptors, activation, mitogenic effects, more mitosis, that can lead to cancer. So this is the simplistic view. This is not all, the, all, all of it. There are a lot more pathways involved. So now these are some of the pathways, and I'm not going to go into, go into detail here, but there are more pathways involved in the final transformation of a person who is obese who gets cancer. What are the, so we'll go to a more basic understanding. Within the last few years, within the last two or three years, we have a concept that integrates metabolism, aging, and cancer together. 
So, um, and this it involves a pathway known as the TOR pathway, or TOR stands for target of rapamycin, and this is a pathway known as mTOR. mTOR stands for metabolic, uh, mammalian target of rapamycin, or uh, so, some people call it mechanistic target of rapamycin. mTOR is a highly conserved system of enzymes, uh, kinases, that are present in one-celled organisms, two-celled organisms, in, and all the way into humans. mTOR is the interface between growth and star starvation. If you have a cell, you know, just think about a single-celled organism living in the ocean. You know, when there is nutrient abundance, that m organism has to multiply, grow, make proteins, and make uh, and store for the future. When this organism became a multicellular organism like our cells, again, we have the same problem. When there is um, periods of plenty, you have to store down fat. When there are periods of starvation, you have to use up fat. So we have conserved this mTOR system across all our cells. And the mTOR system is the ultimate sensor which senses starvation and uh, uh, obesity, starvation and plentifulness. Turns out that it is even more complicated than that. So when, when the mTOR system is activated, um, it actually, mTOR is activated in periods when there is availability of nutrients. So when it's activated, it lays down fat, it actually promotes cell division, and it, uh, it is a mitogenic stimulus. It, it causes cancer cells to divide and multiply. When mTOR is shut down, it is a starvation phase. You, cells do not age, they recycle more and more of their organelles, and they don't store down fat. So some of the signals that activate or inhibit mTOR are nutrients, energy, stress, and growth factors. From an evolutionary perspective, this was very important for us because our ancestors grew up through times of hardship where food was not always available. So when there is intermittent food intake, there is a need to keep the nutrient levels in the plasma at a stable level, and they have highly evolved, very finely tuned mTOR mechanisms. So fasting and starvation is the ultimate inhibitor of mTOR, and chronic overfeeding or chronic high availability of nutrients is the ultimate stimulant of mTOR. And Underlying all our current modern chronic problems is the over-availability of food, which leads to mTOR activation, which then leads to chronic multiplication of cells, which also leads to lipo lipogenesis, insulin resistance, cellular aging, and which leads to a lot of our problems. If you think about it, most of the, our problems can be linked to that one mechanism which we are overstimulating with food. So how does mTOR relate to cancer? These are some of the cancers in people who have genetically modified, genetic mutations in the mTOR pathway. Many of you know these, Peutz jeggers syndrome, hemangiomas in the cerebellum. These, so if you, have, if you have a child who's born with an mTOR mutation, one of the, one of the mTOR uh, pathway mutations, they get all these cancers. So mTOR is clearly linked to cancer, and as I showed you, mTOR is clearly linked to uh, obesity. Can we do something about it? That's the bigger question. Are there drugs that can inhibit mTOR? So obviously, mTOR stands for target of rapamycin. So rapamycin is one drug. There's another drug called sirolimus. There's other drugs called everolimus. There are a lot of drugs that are now coming, targeted drugs at mTOR. None of them have been used in diabetes successfully yet, but it'll be coming. Another mechanism of mTOR, which will be important to all of us, is aging. Every human being is trying not to age. You know, we, are, we put dye on our hair, we try to look young, we exercise, but cellular aging is a function of mTOR, um, and it is a time-dependent de decline in cell function, which is mediated by this particular pathway. And there is more and more impetus, especially uh, in the West, to consider aging as a disease. You know, I know most of us think that aging is natural, but there is a uh, concept of many people who think that aging is a disease. This is called the life extension movement. And uh, if you can think about it, this is a 100-year-old man who's riding a bicycle. Turns out that there are almost 100,000 people living in the United States right now who are more than 100 years old. And by 2020, they think there will be about a million people in the US who are more than 100 years old. And they all want to look like this guy and to ride bicycles. You know, I hope all of us here also can do that. So one of the very interesting things that you might be interested in is that a very powerful inhibitor of this whole pathway is something that we already use in our day-to-day -day practice, metformin. And there is a lot of epidemiologic evidence that people are on, who are on metformin have a lower incidence of cancer. All retrospective, backward-looking studies. There are no prospective studies that have answered that question yet. 
So there is a, the biggest question is, should we repurpose metformin as a cancer prevention drug? Does it help non-diabetic? You know, I don't have diabetes. Should I take metformin in the hope that I can prevent? Small dose of metformin might prevent uh, a cancer in the future. So there are all these studies. These are some studies that are ongoing where your people are trying to use metformin prospectively to prevent cancer. Colorectal cancer, chemo prevention in endometrial cancer, chemo prevention for non-small cell lung cancer in smokers, all sorts of things. So the uh, Barrett's is off, I guess, people are taking metformin to prevent cancer. So this is, again, metformin acts by inhibiting AMP-dependent kinase, which is ultimately an inhibitor of met mTOR. If I, just before summarizing, I would like to leave you with some practical clinical points. I know all of us here are clinicians. So first things I would like you to remember from my talk is that diabetics are twice as likely to get cancer of the liver, pancreas, endometrium, and several others that I showed you. Colon, breast, bladder, again, goes up in diabetics. Prostate cancer is the only cancer that's lower in diabetics. People with diabetes have a higher mortality when they get cancer. Diabetics who are on cancer therapy have shorter remissions and higher complications. And then a lot of things that we do in chemotherapy make diabetes worse. So there has to be a partnership between you guys and us, the oncologists. Nausea, vomiting, hydration, all of these things make your diabetes worse. Diabetes increases your risk of infections. We do take out neutrophils, all of that. And last but not the least, there are a lot of opportunities for research in this field, in the cancer and diabetes field. There are biomarkers that we need to identify, which will tell us when um, we are activating the mTOR system, which then ultimately leads to cancer and diabetes. We have to study metformin and also statins as adjuncts in cancer care or cancer prevention. An important question is, should non-diabetics use some of these drugs to prevent the risk of cancer? There are also some dual inhibitors of uh, mTOR pathway and other cancer pathways, which are also coming out. And finally, please enjoy my city. Thank you. That, that was a very sweet and wonderful talk and finishing bang on dot in time. Bang on dot, like American Airlines. <laughs> Could we have a couple of uh, questions? We have we left behind with three, four minutes. Nice of Dr. Harry to leave those uh, few minutes. So the, ba the basic question is if you already attribute hyperinsulinemia and insulin, now giving tons of insulin, does it make the possibility of cancer worse? Uh, so, uh, so that is a very interesting question. So I don't think we'll ever be an able to answer that question because if you're diabetic, your risk of cancer goes up and then you're more likely to get insulin because you're diabetic. And then, so obviously insulin and insulin-like growth factors are pro-cancer drugs. And metformin is the only drug that you guys are using which actually prevents cancer in any, any form of, any sh way, shape or form. Maybe all of you, sh all, of, uh, all the diabetics should be on metformin, I don't know what the… They are, the, they uh, are. There's one area where we have no controversy that every type 2 diabetic should be on metformin. Metformin. And when you happen to come from a starwood uh, subcontinent, your mTOR level is very high, so you have all the possibility <laughs> of <laughs> aging a bit early. <laughs> yes, sir. The benefits of metformin in cancer prevention, that is if you take two grams, is it superior to uh, just 500 milligrams? So the, um, that's actually a very good question. Actually, if, if it was dose related, it will tell us the answer that this is actually doing it. The problem is right now, all the evidence we have for metformin preventing cancer is retrospective studies. So, you know, just people who are on metformin versus people who are not on metformin and equal risk of cancer, they, we can show that people who took metformin have lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of uh, cancer. The prospective studies are actually using very low doses, not up to two grams. They are usually 500 BID, like one gram. Um, and I don't know of any study which is using higher doses, but you know, because the problem is they're not for cancer, but diabetic patients, they're also for, also for non-diabetics. So I think that's why they are using lower doses. There is a group from Montreal, whom I heard a couple of years back in ESD, who are prospectively studying the impact of metformin in cancers. But understandably, like coronary artery disease, it's not going to take a couple of years. It's going to take right. a couple of decades to give answers. Exactly. So you wouldn't have an immediately an answer. Retrospective data and observation data has huge problem on its own in observational. We know, you know, for decades we had great observational data on estrogens in postmenopausal women. When the prospective study went on, it had to be stopped after 3.4 years because of the disasters it caused. So, with that caveat… <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes. Sir, latest concern on uh, pyoglitazone and cancer? Pun? 
പയോക്ലിറ്റസോൺ ആൻഡ് ക്യാൻസർ ഐ തിങ്ക് ചെയർമാൻ ക്യാൻ ചേക്ക് understandably if you look at the proactive trial now retrospectively uh, there were some doubts but additional 2 years data has cleared pyogalitism as uh, professor harry very aptly said that, that this is what i was referring to in my first sentence that there will be some cancers which are higher in patients who have diabetes related to drug or not related to drug there was a difference of 3 cases between the pyogalitism group and when that statistical analysis became significant but over the next two years it got blunted so unlikely but the caution still needs to be observed the bottom line is you know whenever in doubt use caution if needed use it smaller the dose better for shorter the period the better that holds true for any drug where you have a question or a caveat if there are no last minute questions thank you very much for being thank so brief and so crisp thank you